Hey there, it's Silver. This is Momodora, Moonlit Farewell. So this is a series, if you've never heard of it before. This is actually the fifth game in the series, and it's also the final one, which is actually kind of sad, because it's a really good series, and it's sort of sad to see it coming to a close. But these games are sort of action platformers with some Metroidvania elements, usually a relatively good-sized world to explore, and a ton of usually pretty impressive boss fights to go against, and a story that weaves throughout all the games. This game's story actually takes place directly after the third game, and that's because the fourth one was actually a uh, prequel that sort of explains more of the backstory of the village that the main characters are from. So this is a direct continuation of the third game, but that being said, it is deliberately written in such a way that if you've never played any of the games, you can still understand what's going on. It's basically because the events of this game's story are mostly self-contained to it. The thing that you're actually trying to solve is unique to this game, so you don't have to have played a bunch of the previous games to sort of get the stakes or anything like that. It's all pretty well contained within this one. So the developer has stated this on the Steam page, actually, that they wanted to make it in such a way that you can still play it if you've never played any of the previous games. Speaking of the story, I will not be spoiling anything major in this video. I won't be showing any later game areas, and I also won't be showing any of like the late game boss fights or anything like that, because this is a pretty short game, as are all of the Momodora games, and I don't want to do that to people. I don't want to spoil the sort of crescendo of the story and all that stuff, so I'm showing you mostly just general exploration in some of the more early areas. So the way that it works is you play Momo, and Momo can do a couple of basic moves that will get expanded on as you go through the game. You've got a leaf, which is actually your weapon, believe it or not, and it has a basic a few hit sort of combo that you can use, and it actually has a fair amount of impact to it. It makes the combat feel pretty good, despite it being a leaf somehow. Something to note about your basic combo, by the way, is that it moves you forward quite a significant amount when you do it, which is important because this game is a platformer, and it's got plenty of narrow platforms to stand on, many of which you will have to fight on, so it is possible to fall off of stuff while attacking because it moves you forward quite a bit. So you gotta be careful about that. You've also got a dodge roll that has pretty generous immunity frames, and uh, you will need these both to avoid attacks and also to roll through enemies because there are plenty of enemies that you can only hit from behind. You do have a stamina gauge that gets used up when you dodge roll, but you also have a bow. And the bow is really quite powerful, but it uses a ton of your stamina if it's full. Basically, if your stamina isn't full, the bow only does a small amount of damage, and it doesn't take any stamina to fire it. But if it is full, it uses it up, pretty much the whole gauge, in order to fire a really powerful arrow. This can be useful in a lot of different circumstances, but it is possible to actually one-shot a lot of enemies with it and stuff too, and is it's very useful against bosses. So you do want to implement the bow into your basic combat, even if you're not necessarily that far away, just because of how powerful it can be. You just gotta be aware of the use of that stamina to make sure that you don't use it all up and make yourself unable to dodge. You also get a sprint later on that just allows you to cover more area more quickly. You can dodge while sprinting and it goes farther than a normal dodge, which can be useful in some of the later game areas against larger enemies. You've also got, of course, a health gauge and an MP gauge. You have a healing bell on the Y button. It is a pretty powerful heal that goes off nearly instantly, so it's super useful to have, but it costs 10 MP per heal. You only have a few charges worth of it at first. However, one of the big things that you'll find while exploring are these permanent increases to your stats that are super useful to get. In fact, they're just about necessary to get for the later areas. You'll find various different kinds of berries that can give you things like extra maximum health and extra maximum MP, as well as a faster stamina regeneration rate, which is super important for the later game areas because you will be doing a lot of dodging and your initial stamina region is pretty slow. You'll actually find a lot of the health increasing ones, which is nice because enemies later in the game will do a lot of damage to you per hit, so you want that extra buffer. And the MP increases are more rare, but of course very useful because each one represents an extra healing charge. Another one you'll find are these lilies, and these will increase your basic attack power. Also very useful because as you go through the game, enemies do get stronger. They will have more health, so being able to do more damage is pretty much necessary, and it's especially necessary against some of the late game bosses, including the optional ones, which we'll get onto in a minute. But yeah, so there's quite a lot of stuff to find in terms of the exploration because you'll be finding all sorts of these berries and flowers and things that can permanently increase your stats. And there's also the sigil system. Uh, sigils are clearly inspired by like tarot cards, but you'll find these a lot during exploration. And these are kind of like pins from Hollow Knight. They are things that you can equip a small number of that will give you various 
different passive benefits, they tend to be really powerful. Uh, at first you can only equip two of them at a time, but very, very occasionally you'll find an item called a grimoire, usually in a really out of the way area, and uh, each one of these will allow you to uh, equip another one. Sigils are pretty important because they do sort of define what build you're using in a way, and they can do all sorts of stuff from, for instance, the ability to revive once if you run out of health, which you have to buy, it costs quite a lot of money, you gain money from killing enemies mostly, or say one that adds shockwaves to your basic attack, so it drastically increases its range, although the shockwaves aren't as powerful as actually hitting directly, they're still pretty good. There's one that drastically increases your full stamina bow shot damage, and there's also some that add extra effects to your arrows, but these cost MP to use, so there's one that gives you a fiery arrow that does damage over time, but it costs like 4 MP per shot, and there's also another one that makes your arrows explode. So there are several different ways to use MP aside from your healing bill that you can find, but of course you gotta be careful about budgeting all that because you probably will need those heals during boss fights and things. Uh, you can also find some companions, and uh, these will float around while you're exploring and just do a couple of small things, depending on what kind of companion they are. There are healer companions that will give you a charge of 10 MP very occasionally, and there's also ones that use an attack spell, and ones that will dig up some money for you occasionally. These are just little cute things that you can find. They're not active during boss fights, so they're only useful while exploring, but they are adorable. And of course you'll also find plenty of other items that aren't related to any of these that just give you extra capabilities. Some of these will be given to you during the story, like say the one that lets you double jump or the one that lets you wall jump, but there are also several of them that add some extra features or conveniences and things that you can get from just exploring in out of the way areas or fighting optional bosses and stuff. There are also a fair number of side quests to complete from uh, just getting specific items, oftentimes from optional bosses to drop or uh, finding these fairies hidden around the world in different places and stuff like that, you can go back to the NPCs and turn them in for some extra cool things. Like for instance, the one where you have to find a locket by beating an optional boss. And if you bring the locket back to its owner, you will gain the ability to uh, enhance your healing belts to where it pulses out a big damaging field around you. So it also does damage to enemies as well as healing you. When it comes to the boss fights, they are really good for the series. It, this series is kind of known for its like big screen filling bosses and this game is no different. It's got plenty of really huge sprites that are gigantic and tend to fill the screen or at least most of it and have a lot of different attacks and sometimes multiple phases. The boss fights are really fun. They're definitely a highlight of the story moments and they have a fair amount of health, which means they can be a bit of an endurance round. And uh, this is exemplified by the fact that usually during phase transitions and stuff, they'll drop some MP for you to refill your MP gauge and get a couple more healing charges from. Now I mentioned that these games are pretty short and this one is no exception, but the size of the games is often used more as an advantage because basically one of the advantages to having a smaller experience like this is that if you're good, you can pace it to where it is a sort of story roller coaster, an adventure all the way through with no downtime, no wasted space. It's like dense with content. And these games do tend to fulfill that really well. They are short, but there's also no busy work and no downtime. It's a game that's full of exploration with tons of stuff to find, as well as a lot of boss fights and some optional stuff too. Despite being a short game, there are optional areas. There are entire optional dungeon-like areas with like gauntlets of enemies and boss fights at the end that give you some useful rewards if you manage to clear them and some story uh, context for certain things as well. And there are also some other moments in the game where certain like bosses will spawn in the world that you can choose to go and hunt if you'd like to. And you can also um, improve the relationship between your character and Cereza, who is out there helping you out. And as you do so, she will stock new sigils for you to buy from her that you can only get from buying them. So there's a reason to work on that as well. So basically all this comes together to mean that Moonlit Farewell is a really good send-off for the series. It is a very niche series for sure, but it's something that I would definitely recommend people get into if they enjoy Metroidvanias or platformers, because it has a lot of those elements and it does a good job of making a world dense with stuff to explore because of their relatively short runtimes. I also just think it's cool to see a developer's 
sort of single developer's baby get this kind of attention, if that makes sense. Like, this is a series they've been working on since, like, 2010 or so, or at least, the, I believe, the first one released in 2010, so I guess even longer than that, technically. And uh, the previous game, uh, Reverie Under the Moonlight, released in 2016, so it's been a while since we've actually had an entry into this series, and I love the fact that this developer actually got to realize their vision for what they wanted the series to be, because not everyone gets to say that, you know, not everyone who is a small team or solo developer gets to actually realize their entire series goal of having a multi-game spanning story and all of this lore and stuff that sort of connects this series as one big kind of franchise and I think it's cool that they've actually managed to succeed and are finally bringing it all to a close now that it's been all these years that it's been in development and it's sort of the capstone at the end of a chapter of their lives I guess you could say it's, it's just cool to have a game industry where we can still see that kind of stuff sometimes. So I'll put the link in the description below this video to the Steam Store page for Moonlit Farewell if you wish to check it out. Thank you guys very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.